Peter, I think, is uh, it's actually pretty great that this is, that Peter Cook is doing the final lecture, I think, for a, a lot of reasons. Um, Peter is um, an architect, an educator, and a networker. Um, you'll see in a minute, I suppose, what that means. Um, I'll try to explain what that means. The um, Peter and some of his friends, I think, were um, did some of the most important work in contemporary architecture and were really instrumental in taking many of the things that were being felt, not really even discussed, in the early 60s and brought it together in, in uh, a set of ideas that took form in such a way that they seem to have been um, permeated to the core of contemporary architecture to such an extent that um, many people of this generation aren't truly aware of the, uh, the significance of the work that they did then. The, um, the other aspect of, of Peter's work has been to connect up people of like mind and similar spirit um, for the last 30 years. The one thing to me that's remarkable about that is the kind of generosity that it takes for someone um, to be interested, sincerely interested in other people's ideas to the extent that he can understand them and be willing to connect up those ideas with the ideas of other people. Kind of a, an architectural matchmaker of sorts. The, uh, the third category, which I think is also um, important to know about, is Peter as an educator. Um, probably has more quality students around the world than anyone else um, in existence. Having taught for, I don't know, perhaps the last 30 years at the AA, at the uh, Stato School in Frankfurt, and now he's the head of the, uh, the uh, architecture department at uh, Bartlett. Uh, he was here this week with a number of his uh, students and some of the faculty that uh, teaches there will be setting up uh, formal exchange um, with the faculty. We already have one with the students. Um, hopefully he's going to be showing um, enough of his own work. He usually spends a lot of time showing the work of others, which is work that many of us know a little bit about, but know more about when he's finished. Um, with that, uh, here's Peter Cook. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm starting a bit late this evening. We had a fairly hilarious early part of the evening involving getting lost around the perimeter of the airport for reasons that are very boring. Um, I'd like to move straight in on the slides since you've been waiting. And the first four pairs of slides um, are really meant as a sort of background, baggage that one carries around with one. Uh, that is an a priori to any of the other things that I will talk about a little later, which will be based around projects uh, not all that old, some slightly old ones, and really, and, and new ones, and really sort of motivators for designing things. Occasionally, of course, very occasionally, the motivator is somebody coming along and asking you to design something. For me and my immediate friends, more often, the motivator is nobody coming along and asking you to do anything at all, but you're just having a sort of bee in your bonnet about something. Could I have the first two slides? Oh, there they are. The, <coughs> the baggage that I carry around, I tell you a funny story about being a pedagogue, which was just one week before I ever first went to teach as a 27-year-old, opinionated, arrogant, spotty, know-all, young educator, you know the type, um, I, they exist in every country. Um, a week before, in, in, uh, I was taken on at the A as the assistant to the fifth year master. Um, this project on the left was published in the English equivalent of the color supplement of the LA Times. It was the color supplement of the Sunday Times. And I knew that one million people had seen it of whom virtually all of the class must be included in that one million. 
that suddenly puts you in a very funny position vis-a-vis -vis your students. Instead of coming along as Mr. Nice Guy or Mr. Humble Assistant or Mr. You know, spotty and arrogant, but you'll discover that, you came along with seven pages in color of this thing that you knew everybody had seen. You knew that probably most of them distrusted it or hated it or thought, who the hell is he anyhow? Or, what, or, or it's weird, what's he about? And I'm, I knew that most of the students that I was going to have to deal with were pretty kind of regular, straight up and down characters. And there was this young, spotty character uh, facing them who had done the plug-in city. It meant that from then onwards, I never needed to play the game of pretending I didn't have a position. I had a position. There it was for all to see. From then on, I knew that um, I didn't have to go through that rigmarole of, 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 of leading them in to know what my views were by stealth. And I think that many of them, particularly in the early days, were quite surprised that I could talk about thatch cottages or castles or rational architecture or you know things they do in Italy or whatever, even though I had done the plug-in city. In other words, there was me, the teacher, the armchair psychiatrist, uh, and there was me, the person that did my own work. And I've always kept it this way. I, I, since I've been at the Bartlett, for instance, and there are one or two people sitting at the back who can vouch for this, I have perhaps bored them by exposing to them what I'm working on currently myself, even including just submitted competitions before the result has come out, or even including half-finished stuff, or things that went wrong. I feel that it's incumbent upon the teacher to have, a, to have their own work going on. We started a thing called Archigram in the year dot before I was teaching, which became famous as now the subject of PhD thesis. You read about yourself uh, as if it was a sort of disembodied thing. And people say to me, God, that must have been amazing. You know, how, how did you do all those things? And, 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 and uh, how did you get away with it? And I said, we just did it. Nobody cared a damn about whether we were doing it. Nobody bought the thing anyhow. I think we sold the magazine to about 103 people um, who were mostly people we knew. And it was only about four or five years later when heavy critics started to write it up that it became a collector's item. And it now costs you probably 500 pounds to buy that thing that nobody wanted to, to buy. I, I want to make a, a general set of comments to each of the first four pairs of slides, uh, which are taken, and this is a plug, taken from the about to be available monograph on my work, which will be in Hennessy's, I'm assured, in five weeks' time. The first quote is a statement about architecture and shrieking. I say, like politics, architecture needs its shrieks and cries, its heroes and villains, its slogans and banners. The instinct of monumentality is not far, far away, just as the wish to be liked is very near to the surface of most of us. A building seems to need, if not to be liked, then admired. If not admired, then understood. If not understood, then at least heard. Cities too seem to subscribe to the same wishes, even though cities are really more like conversational groups or crowds, with certain individuals given status or given a louder voice. A parade or charade is played out whereby the voices are expected to be heard at a certain moment and then stay silent. The palace at the end of the avenue is given the right to declaim loudly and majestically, often with a series of architectural platitudes. Whereas, in a back street somewhere, a raunchy little building, perhaps the ill-considered extension to the wash house, sniggers away and cares little who listens. Next slide. I'm fascinated by ambiguity. I'm fascinated by things that are not crystal clear, that are not thrown at you head on, that are not full frontal attacks upon the sensibility. 
I'm fascinated by looking in a Turner painting and, and surmising what it might be, what might be indicated, what might be there. And, and one's imagination is called upon to play. I'm fascinated by marshland, that in indeterminate territory between being there and not being there, between terra firma and terra definitely not firma. The, the, the land is there and the water is there. Sometimes it's flooded, it's threatened, it's sponge-like. I'm fascinated by it as a, a kind of uh, model for the three-dimensional city, but that would take a, another complete lecture. Another quote. An English characteristic that I find useful is to be derived from our literary tradition. The narrative path that runs in a gently indirect way, casting occasional sidelong glances into character or vista, and throwing a half-light upon incidents along the way, but rarely reaching a definite conclusion. Part of the mode of life that shuns both political extremism or even definition, as well as philosophical determinism. It often appears both indecipherable and irritating to those, for example, of the French or German intellectual tradition. Yet, in its inconsistent and indulgent way, it is a marvelous basis for artistic speculation. Next. Next slide. I come from the seaside. I'm a sort of professional seaside person. That's why I've, for, for more than 20 years, found Los Angeles terribly instantly acceptable and even at first visit uh, instantly recognizable. Uh, I like the fact, and, and you guys here will be familiar with the sort of thing, not only the sort of correctly use, architecturally useful kind of examples such as the pier structures on the left, but things like the object on the right, which is in the image of a well-known English plastic tomato ketchup dispenser uh, available in, in cheap cafes. Uh, the only problem is that, is that it's selling candy floss and it's not tomato colored. Uh, and is blown up in size. If you get your head around that kind of situation, uh, you're prepared for almost any architectural eventuality. Another quote. To erect a point of departure and then dismantle it is an interesting enough exercise, but it is still, for my taste, too Puritan. What if some of the effects of dismantling choose to stick and others even remantle themselves? The delightful irritation of living in a large and untidy city is that you never quite know whether it will work or whether you will bump into the same people in the street as yesterday. Next. Next slide. A tower designed by me uh, about a year before I was that spotty youth starting teaching and a tower designed by somebody else on the English seaside. The, the tower is a house in a silly place, except that the house isn't the part that looks like the house, but the black bit underneath, the house being a water tower. Except that it isn't a water tower any longer because they didn't need it and they moved in with the oxyacetylene burners, uh, put back the windows, and so the house that wasn't a house, sitting on the house, is now also a house. Again, I think if you can wrap your head around these kinds of things, it's at least as useful as reading Vitruvius. I must admit, final quote, I must admit to a love-hate relationship with the acceptance of historical consequence. The politics of change could also be expressed as a paradigm of the politics of misuse, random factors, and the unrecognized. For every one spectator that lines his eye in the correct spot to enjoy the axis, the entesis, or the articulation of parts, there are three other people who just shuffle past deep in their own thoughts, though there's undoubtedly a feel to certain places. To ignore this constituency of architecture is all too tempting and can be associated with the inevitable wish of a scholar or a designer to be true to a direction or a commitment. Hence the pursuit of the clean drawing of absolutely equal line thickness, lest any preference sully the discussion. Next. 
I think there's a tradition in countries that have been layered with 2,000 or more years of continual history uh, to think of them only romantically as countryside. The, the project on the left was an insertion into perhaps northern European English countryside, but it's a countryside that after all has had many battles fought over it, many par parcelings of land, bad winters, good winters, stupid second sons of second sons, cow disease, wars, uh, occasional famine, silly things done with trees, good things done with trees. So actually, it isn't land as God left it. It is urbanized land. It is as much urbanism as a city. And once I'd taken that idea on board, I, I became interested in, in veggies as a constituent part of architecture. And I think this sort of slightly wayward uh, tradition of looking at architecture is something that I probably learned from my own teacher, Peter Smithson, who was doing this project at the time when he was teaching us. He too went through that situation of having his things well published at the time when he was trying to be even-minded about the people he was teaching. There is this kind of mixture of romanticism, odd placement, uh, dégagé organizations that, though I, in the slide on the left interpreted and sunk it into the country. Peter Smithson was sinking into Berlin. Next, next slide. I invented a city called Arcadia, which the word itself is my own slight misuse of, of, of the true word. Arcadia, for my money, meaning something lovely and gentle and memorable and, and slightly sort of doggy, slightly friendly, sort of where mum and dad and granny uh, somehow a nice gentle place and I located I invented a location which was my favorite kind of location a gently falling river in a in a probably English uh, valley somewhere and actually though when you moved into my invented town you found that it was actually made up of at least half a dozen different very distinctly different types of people next these people live on a long, straight, hard street. They definitely work for a living. Their building is sheathed in steel. There are at least three locking devices to get into the door. And the picture tells the story about them. No messing, tough, relentless. The window cleaner has seen it all before. Slotted angle only is used to erect the partitions. No messing. A little bit of romantic stuff happening on the roof, but that's another story. Next. By contrast, the romantics, the dreamers, the poets, the busy growing their food hydroponically into the water, they're thinking beautiful thoughts. The girl is in a, a dress probably by Laura Ashley. Um, and, you know, they, they're lovely and they live up in these slightly remote towers with their feet decorously dangled in the marshland below. Next. Or they're an old Viennese couple with a high ceiling department such as you would get in Vienna. It happens to be peacock styling of the apartment and the, the, the walls are, are a little different. But they have beautiful things and beautiful memories and intelligent conversation and the plants that you see on the edge of the, of the, the room are carefully, beautifully tended, they're hand-reared plants. And the peninsula upon which they live is of course safe, it is protected, it has gardens below and creeping up into the apartments. Next. Whereas these guys are completely different. They have, if you look carefully at the drawing on the left, they have plants too, but almost certainly made of plastic. They're not going to piss around watering plants all the time. Uh, they need a couple of bathrooms, even for a small apartment, but for, for reasons that are obvious just if you look at them. And, and uh, they live in deep, deep set apartments which have muted glass around so that uh, light can be brought right into the middle of the building and you get some kind of a sniff of what's going on in the adjoining apartment. Next. Or there's Mr. and Mrs. Average with the average kids 
and average car and average layout of the average building, uh, except there is a built-in perversity to the building. The organization of how you arrive at it is not quite that direct, just as those people aren't as simple or as boring as they seem. And so Arcadia City, next slide, is made up of all these people, and these which are in some ways uh, my favorite quote. The building organization has, of course, its cricket greens in the front and putting green. It's almost like a stage version of an English landscape, an English idiosyncrasies of wanting to hide behind the wall and dig yourself in and rush around in the trees. The people are very typical of English bourgeoisie, the boring way in which they will continually discuss wine or do their attempts at, at French cooking or uh, wear their beards in a certain way or have totally obnoxious male offspring and slightly naughty female offspring. Uh, but all is well under the chestnut tree with the dog. And it's, it's a sort of doggy kind of uh, building. Next. I move on to with Christine Hawley a, a competition project where we looked into this thing of digging into the undergrowth in a slightly more organized way, keeping holding sort of two balls in the air almost simultaneously where one is concerned with transparency and translucency and, and totally the architecture of the late 20th century. On the one hand, and kind of grottos and gardens and arbors and, and growies on the other hand, these two things which might be seen to be incompatible but which we wish to make compatible. Next. And in a project which was drawn by Christine and modeled by me, we take this theme of the incompatible further. The idea of a water garden developing into an appliance kitchen, the idea of hedgerows coming in and, and being analogous and directly f formed as the furniture of the main room, of the water trickling down from the hillside on the left through the bedroom areas and that the, the project is called the shadow house because the whole point was that all should not be necessarily what it seems, that the things seen in shadow are just as important as the things seen extant. Next. And so various projects concerned with folding and weaving and disintegrating and metamorphosing. The shadow house can be traced in the plan on the left the water falling through it into a project called Layer City, where the layers are layer overlaid layers in plan, forming a kind of soft, endlessly overlaid collage in section, forming a whole series of, of rather disparate, but nonetheless reflective uh, systems. Systems of pavilions, systems of hedges, systems of trees, systems of offices, systems of pylons, all with their each with their own. <coughs> Uh, each with their own geometry, each with their own progress, but deliberately nudging and sailing over. In other words, this, this notion of collage, which was developed, of course, by Colin Rowe in his famous book, Collage City, um, taken further because of the collage almost in a state of play rather than just neatly juxtaposed. Next. And the layer city finding its way down into the sea. Next. I spent a lot of time in Frankfurt. I still go there about seven or eight times a year. And Frankfurt until recently, I suppose with the rebirth of, of Berlin as a, as, a, as, a, as a true center of Germany, its ambitions are, are stunted. But Frankfurt for many years in the recent past has great wealth and wanted to acquire culture and wanted even to become an international major city, a city of the, of the importance of its airport, as it were. And observing it closely, I realized that one of its characteristics was that it's terribly small and made up of, of a number of separated smallish towns, really. And I called this project Real City. My intention was to 
give it some heroic elements that would begin to pull these small towns together without necessarily filling them all in. So there you see on the map two or three rows of, of villas. Next. In detail on the left we see that row of villas with the backyard industry creeping back on it and the, and the vegetable plots running around it. And my notion was to establish these villas only as hulks. Here is the hulk. Just cheap material compounded, hunk together into elevator shafts and escape corridors. And then, next, interpreted one way or t'other. Interpreted, if you like, in the kind of Tel Aviv mannerism on the left or in Peacock vegetation mannerism on the right. Or next, left as a series of, of, of danglers. Across the water, I devised a kind of alternative museum. I, it was the period uh, recently when Frankfurt has been building a lot of very formalistic museums. And I felt that the, the museum of an industrial and working city ought to be something a bit more enjoyable. It ought to be a park. And I found an old dock where this park could be dangled over the water. Next. The park made, as it were, a vertical park with a great deal of planting and only occasionally snuck into the, the parts of the vertical uh, verdure uh, little pavilions, very much in the Japanese tradition. So much in the Japanese tradition, next slide, that I was able to reconvene the same project as an entry into the Kawasaki Information City project. I found that, that Lo and behold, the two site conditions were almost identical. All I had to do for the competition drawings to flip, flip the thing around and take the power station off. And, and I was in business. <coughs> that rarely happens, but uh, it seemed too good to miss. And it got me a free trip to Japan in the, in the process, because I got a prize. So, by the way, um, it's called resource use, I think, in, in the game. I think that by this time I'd returned many, many years after Plugin City. It was the first time at which I was psychologically able to return to an idea which in the intervening years I would have probably balked away from. That is the idea of the megastructure. Okay, this megastructure looks different, feels different, has a different infill. But there is that, if you've gone producing work long enough, there's this thing of cyclic love-hate relationships that you have not just because certain things are fashionable or unfashionable, but you actually get bored with them. You know, you do sort of three megastructures, you say, well, I got the hang of those, you know, even if nobody wants to build one, and, and you move then to something else, and then years later you say, hey, that, there's something in there, let's have another look. But it, it, it becomes an armature upon which different ideas are hung, and I think that actually even in the early stages I was very conscious of that kind of walking that you can do through, for example, gardens in Kyoto, where to stop at the place of the tea ceremony and to pause and to maybe rest and then to look at a certain small-scale vista and then ponder and then perhaps move on. This, this whole procedure of working your way, again, through urbanized vegetation is, is something that I'm very attached to as an architectonic means. Next. And sometimes one makes projects that are quite frankly um, a kind of vicious response. There was a period in, in England where there were a whole lot of guys going around saying everything ought to be very gentle and ought to be very natural and ought to be made of natural materials and you ought to wear sandals and eat brown rice and wear Harris tweed jackets and all that. And, and I thought, fuck you, you know, I'm going to do something that you will hate. I know something that you will hate. It's going to be absolutely artificial, sleek as shit. It's going to be made of, of acid, you know, artificial coloration. No, none of your browns and yellows and stuff like that. Nothing, nothing natural. All manufactured, shiny, a tart's face in the in the in the in the in the, in the 18th century tradition of the of the of the restoration comedy coquette. You will notice always has the occasional planted beauty spot. There in, on the tart space, you see these little bubbles that are the sort of to call attention to the 
perfection and sleekness of the thing. There we are. And, and, and on the other hand, one is much more quiet and humble in, in, in particular places where you, you, you have a sort of respect. I, I, I was, Kristin Feireis of the 80s gallery in Berlin is sometimes asked various Lebius and, and various other people, myself, to, to do projects for particular cities. Sometimes it's Berlin, sometimes it's Paris, and so on. And this is a project I did for Paris. Now, if, you, if you're from England, the, the, the sort of love-hate relationship between the English and the French is a funny one. And you, if you live in London, you visit Paris with a sort of slight curl of the lip. And if you're in Paris, you visit London with an equal curl of the lip. And you kind of slightly fearful of its decorousness. I always feel that, that London and Los Angeles have a very similar uh, psychological character in, in the way in which you behave and that Paris and New York have a similar psychological character. And so I was almost being very humble in the map there. You can see that the little red dots, which are the location plan of this scheme, um, the little red dots are sort of inserted and I'm saying, I'm, I'm, do you mind if I sort of take a very cheap site by the river or just, just mosey in the corner there? It won't do you any harm. Uh, and then if you think it's a good idea, there's some more locations where I could do some more of them. So actually it's a chain of these things. Next. And the, oh no, other way. Yeah. And uh, in detail plan, you see it's a series of, of, of uh, apartments on two floors uh, able to rotate. I don't mean whizzing round like some sort of restaurant on the top of a TV tower, but, but adjustable so that if, uh, you know, uh, Monsieur Le Comte is being rather boring and you can hear him nagging at his wife, then you turn 17 and a half degrees away. Or if, you, you know, the neighbor's dog gets on your nerves, you turn 12 degrees the other way. Or if there's begins to be in the autumn a beautiful sunset that appears over the Champs-Élysées, then you turn 43 degrees. Um, and it gives you that option. And also you'll notice on the plan and in the, in the axonometric, you'll notice these sort of red little numbers that are clinging on to the sides of these apartments, which are escape. They are in the tradition of the garden shed where you suddenly have very important things to do to do potting out the plants, which means you want to escape from the family, which is very much in the English and German tradition. I'm not sure whether it's in the French bourgeois tradition, but probably could be. And so you get this, I think, rather untypically Parisian uh, project of the mechanics, the escape huts, and the vegetation that creeps up along with it. So that, again, my preoccupation here is, is not just of a, of a horizontal but vertical park, but a truly vertical park running up the whole tower. Next. Other towers, such as for the city of Oslo, uh, a city I, I, I know probably better than Paris and, and feel more at home in, um, where there is long, dark evenings, and where there's a tradition of building large lanterns which you plant on the wall. I developed the lanterns, the lantern of the scale of a, a light, the lantern of the scale of a bay window, the lantern of the scale of a whole room, the lantern of the scale of a whole apartment, and finally at the top of the building, the lantern of the scale of the whole building. So it's a progressive lanterning of these towers. Next, by day and by night, or in Brisbane, by day and by night, taking the tradition of, of uh, one-story metal buildings and taking the kind of climate which is similar to that of Los Angeles but damper uh, and full of bugs, uh, of lifting your proposed towers up off the ground and ventilating everything, building a series of fans that are footbridges, overstructured footbridges with screens that catch the breeze, many balconies that catch the breeze. Taking from these places with one's love, hate, amusement, quizzicality to the way in which one finds oneself in the town and responding back to it, I suppose, with, I suppose, it's for you to say, with, with my own vocabulary but with a vocabulary which flexes to the, this sort of response. Next. And sometimes totally abstract, a city simply derived from a piece of music in its layout. Next. Or, of course, much, much 
more modest things. Uh, a project for a folly. This was the uh, exhibition in New York of, of uh, I think it came here actually, as well, as I remember. Uh, started at the Castelli Gallery. I think it came to the Cochrane Gallery, or Corcoran, however it's called here. Mine, of course, was characteristically on the English seaside, and I had this little storyline that went with it that only the sort of person with an enormous amount of money could, could, could float this kind of indulgence of a, of a little folly, and would therefore, when the folly was finished, would invite all their friends to a house party on the terrace of the big house, just out of the picture, and they would all arrive and they would have their gin and tonic or their sherry on the terrace and say, oh, marvelous, I'm sure you get an extraordinary, extraordinarily good view of the sea from here, it's very good, very nice. Only one or two of them would actually bother to go down and find out. And they would walk down to this little simple town to get a view of the sea. And they would enter. Next. And they would climb. And it is blue. It's very, very blue. And as they would climb, you notice that the detail of the, of, of the handrails and the lamps and the screens gets more and more spooky as you climb up. That's a cutaway view of the inside on the right. And you climb and at a certain point halfway up it becomes omnipresent. It becomes quite spooky and vibrating and strange. And then you climb and you get a view of the sea, like, like we said. Next. Sometimes one makes modest objects because they're the only things that uh, one gets commissions to do. Small follies things for displaying Nigerian fabrics in the wrong part of, of uh, Japan or other. Or sometimes, next slide, uh, slightly more substantial follies. In Osaka, uh, Christine Hawley and I made this folly uh, knowing that ours was to be placed on the far side of the lake from the main entrance. In other words, that in the sort of typical Japanese summer climate, Everybody would be thoroughly fed up with the lake and absolutely sweating and waiting, you know, looking for a hamburger or whatever uh, at the point at which they reached this. And we, we were fascinated to take one aspect of the Japanese tradition, that of the performance and the mask and the, and the, the use of black to mean that something is not there in, in, in certain forms of Japanese theatre. You see these guys running around the stage and you say, what are those guys doing? And your Japanese companion will say, they're not there. You say, they're there. You just see them running around. You say, they're far off, not there. Uh, meaning that they are not to be read as being there. And, and we were interested in this. So we use the, the bit that hangs back from the mask as effectively not being there. It's just support for the notion of the quiet, gentle, after this huff and puff, lots of things being very rhetorical. It's huff and puff. It's very gentle quiet place. But something happens to attract your attention to it. Next. The something happens and you come in. Next. You pass down a black corridor into what is effectively a kind of protected car wash. Water spilling all over you and trickling under your feet through the grating. And as you turn to look back at that lake that you walk around, you see it diffused in a kind of Turner-esque, distorted vision, all is not quite what it seems. Next, and you turn and you descend and you realize that all that water that's being pumped out of the lake has been collected and, next slide, every one and three quarter minutes <laughs> very, very loud noise and, and this thing explodes and, and, and the quiet wand just distorts slightly. That's the reason, if you're that interested, that's the reason why you come in. Next slide. It was in some ways a quotation of the building that since our offices existed, we most have ever wanted to build, which is a project for a glass museum uh, in a little town near Frankfurt called Langen. A very quiet town. The plan is running south at the top of the drawing north at the bottom. The north side faces the old church, the old trees, the monument. It's very quiet, gentle, elegant. The south side faces a sort of funny old yard which has lots of backs of buildings and car parking and noisy people and all sorts of things. So the, the, the north side is discreet, 
The south side lets it all hang out. Next slide. In model and plan, you see that the, the, the north side can, has the light tight box with the, the blue glass ramp climbing up, winding, and going past the restaurant and, and, and raising up. Next. And there is the north side. You, you can see that, that the, the coloration, the, 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 the substance of the, the Osaka folly was really us sort of having this memory of this, this building just a little bit. Although I think that the drawing adds some dimension of the kind of materiality that we were probably heading for. Next. So that as you walk by, you at night see the restaurant lit up and you come in and still one or two of the exhibits are left lit even out of hours and you start to get interested in the stained glass culture by stealth. In fact, the brief of the thing was to include a beer keller for the old folk, a youth club where the younger people could have a beer, uh, a restaurant where the bourgeoisie could have a glass of white wine and for a whole month of the year the requirement of an enormous tent that traditionally sits on that place uh, where the apple wine festival is. So actually it's a place for drinking in with a bit of culture on the side um, if you like to look at it that way around. Next. And here is the south place where the building as it were metamorphoses from this very calm, quiet, just with a chink of exposure to a very full-bodied, south-facing, smiling, glitzy sort of architecture. One, in a way, is often intrigued by this Jekyll and Hyde way in which a building can develop. Next slide. And here we see it in the, in the version from Langen and in the version from Berlin, where in this case we're talking about a piece of housing. Usefully, next slide. Um, the plan organization is that the east side is where there are bedrooms and bathrooms and therefore small windows and the west side has the double height volumes, the view of the park, the family foregathering in the late afternoon, it all, you know, the, the, the orientation in a sense designs the building. And we had an edict from the city of Berlin that we could use additional distance for requoting an old Berlin tradition which is that of the winter garden and so we start to get to a layered kind of building which is very much consistent with our way of working of this layering next here you see it the east side on the left where we surrounded by much more rational architects than ourselves said okay cook and hauling can be rational too if you want us to be and then we let it all hang out on the west side uh, where it becomes a jolly building and a cheerful building and a family building and there's plants and dogs and cats and granny and everybody in the park. And if you want it, a, a view of Matthias Unger's building on the other side of the street. <coughs> Next. And this layering. Next. In the apartments, some we managed to do quite, a, quite deliberately quite a wide range of different apartments for so small a building. And always thinking of glimpses and atmospheres and distortions of the space so that it wasn't as pokey, it wasn't as, as, as constrained as it has to be, uh, bearing in mind that it's subsidized housing and there is not an endless budget. It's also amusing to see these two slides, the one on the right, the architect's vision of the space, and the one on the left when a Turkish family with six kids has moved in. Next. Or certain of the apartments which have their own sort of special idiosyncrasies and odd pieces of the building that were added to our design but after the contract was over. The, the, the back porch was on the drawings, not built as you saw in the, earlier, in the earlier slide until they seemed to have found more money and then they tacked it on. I guess that sort of thing happens in LA all the time. Next. In Berlin still, um, a fascination with another part on the west of Berlin, the western edge of, the, of West Berlin, as it was just still then. Hallensee, which is surrounded by villas, this, this lake surrounded by villas, and behind it's a very spooky sort of railway land. Next. 
I decided to make a project that was a, a West, Western version of Westness. Uh, West being America, American money being pumped into what was then West Berlin, and the notion of what you would do if you added true Westernness to Berlin. I do my own version of a sort of I am pay architecture, if that I can do. Next. And the plan formation, as you see it on the left, with a, with a series of, of uh, rectangular uh, block system, positions for the high rise. And then, if you see the later version of the plan on the right, something else creeping in, something else generated much more surreptitiously from a little point on the center of the small island and another point on the center of the freeway intersection. And this other thing is also generated by the West, but it's a little bit of different West. Next. Generated by the cactus of the, of the true West. The cactus as architecture, the cactus even creeping and transmogrifying and taking over even the highest of the high rises. Even that I am pay like building starts to be played with by the second architecture, the second architecture of the West. Next. Here you see a typical street corner. In the, in the uh, slide on the left, the earlier version, there, are, there is a you know, warehouse building and an office building and some clubs and stuff. And uh, some guys working in the building on the right-hand side say one day, hey, there seems to be a kind of cactus outside. And I say, yeah, great. Little, little expecting that what will happen is that, that that will have affected their office block. Though the elevators and the uh, structure is still there if you, if you poke around. Next. Other parts which are probably more inspired by my seaside origins and memories of, of Hitler's bunker or whatever. Next. And here you see a much later developed version of the, of the plan where things have got very spooky indeed. And sometimes, and I, about once every three years, I do one of these, these kind of uh, metamorphosing projects. And, and, and they usually get, you know, I start them off with an idea in my mind and, and a guess of what, will, what it'll be like about one and a half moves ahead. I do the first drawing, and then things start to develop. I do the second, and I'm starting to already think of the fourth one. And I get to about number six, and it's got totally out of hand. I say, shit, I'd better stop now. Um, <laughs> that's it. Uh, as sort of is represented in these two, where just when it gets really interesting, but you don't know where it would go, it just got really out of hand. You stop. Next. And in another part of Berlin, um, I was asked by a German magazine to look at Breitscheidplatz, which is very much used now that Berlin is united. It's part of what was West Berlin. It's a big sort of square around the Kaiserkapelle. Uh, an area s with um, big blank sort of plaza surrounded by these slab blocks with, if you have a taste for these things, some remarkably good 50s specials. Just a little 50s special there that I rather like. Next. Uh, Kaiser Capella in the center. My notion is to, to drape all of these slabs and bring the drape down across the ground as a sort of a priori, a leavening uh, first move. Next. And then to get off on these two, two rounded corner buildings which are on the south side of the, of the square. It's marvelous. Not brilliant buildings, but great corners. Great, big, generous curved corners and start to gyrate, start to bring the people. There's many perambulators that you get. That people just wander around this area, just hang out there, and enormous numbers now. You bring them up and gyrate them and start to walk them about around these nodes. Bring the zoo into the picture. Bring some of the animals out of the constraints of the zoo into some of these nodes. Next. And begin a swirling process. Next slide. Uh, which is seen in axonometric and in some detail on the right. You'll notice in amongst the nodes there's a sort of uh, son or daughter of cactus that has uh, by, by now become an essential part of my vocabulary. Uh, though he's probably a slightly gentler one than in the earlier project. Next. And some quotes of, of this project to be found in, in a fairly hard-ass project that uh, 
Christine and I did for a competition for the World Trade Center, also in Berlin. The glass, grass, uh, the swirl, still there in, in essence. Next. We sometimes work together with Ron Heron in, in Hamburg, our nautical origins, both Christine and I having been children living by the sea at different places, different times, and Ron Heron uh, having been brought up in London's Docklands. So all three of us working in Hamburg uh, were very familiar with the flotsam and jetsam of, of the sea and ships and the idiosyncrasies of ships and the, and the parts of ships. Next and very conscious quotations in what we made into a land pier, a pier that rides the land and to which, as it were, metaphorical boats pull up, uh, though these boats are working part pieces of architecture. Next, whether they be hotel and conference use on the left or a small-scale museum riding the cliff on the right. Next. And with this notion of the working part, um, one jumps to a more most recent project uh, in Frankfurt, in the Art Academy, the Städelschule there, where I've taught for a long time, still do a little bit of teaching. Um, <coughs> we were asked to do a restaurant, a cafeteria, in the courtyard of the building. A courtyard which has some old uh, Doric columns that held up a small awning. And then some rooms inside the main part of the building to use as the kitchen and the bar area and so on. And we wanted to make it somewhere that could breathe. Next. And it breathes. It, it has a mouth that breathes. In the winter, we, 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 what, this was just finished before, just before Christmas. And in the winter, it seems to sort of breathe about every half hour. It's, it gets pretty cold in Frankfurt. Um, I haven't been there recently. I'm intrigued to see what it's going to be like under the May sunshine, uh, where presumably it will breathe rather more frequently. And then it's just a very simple drape that, that opens and shuts its mouth, a drape over the columns next with necessary engineering, the guy who signs the checks, looking slightly worried in the slide on the bottom, um, and the breathing apparatus next. And since it's a, a student canteen, basically, uh, it's designed with sort of kick around detailing. Next. Back in London, I live in this red brick area which is at the bottom of Hampstead, um, <coughs> below Hampstead. And I'm, I'm doing a series of projects for this area. No, nobody has asked me to, but that's what I'm doing. And um, London is always presumed to be very damp. And it's Hampstead, and I have to apologize for the titling, which is therefore Dampstead. Um, next slide. The insidious way in which dampness creep into the fabric intrigues me. It's not something I think to be reviled against, I think it's something to actually be used. And I start to use it and also of course it's, it's a, an excuse for the development of hedges and growies to also act as part of that creeping uh, useful materiality. Next. The buildings leapfrog or tiptoe across the land so that the actual ground imprint is very small, allowing therefore some of the pre-existing structures to carry on being there with the, the housing tiptoeing over it. The housing with its own catchment of water that is then trickled gradually down, it's controlled trickling, next. Controlled trickling which uh, you see both in the model and the slightly later uh, elevation drawing then causes growth upwards. The horizontal red bands are streams which you can walk on and develop your balconies on. Actually, it's direct quotations of the Osaka folly. We walk on the grating over the water. Next. On the north side, it's cool, 
and calm, somewhat like the east side of our Berlin building. On the west side, it again, a, a slight requotation of, of Berlin, it allows the true nature of the interior to actually hang out. It actually discloses this, this much more uh, degage interior than you might be led to expect. The dripping on the north and south sides. Next. And down the street, the last thing that I'm going to show you, down the street I'm now looking at the local um, train station. So it's a commuter train station, sub subway station. Uh, and I'm looking at an area, I'm living in an area, which is full of the, what I would call entrepreneurial intellectuals. It's an area lived in by lots of people who, who went to college, but sort of do funny things with it. Uh, lots of psychiatrists, lots of dance teachers, people who teach in universities, high proportion of Jewish, Chinese, Japanese people, people with a sort of bit of a sniff here and there, but with odd, odd setups, doing you know, car trading and, and uh, psychology readings at the same time kind of characters. And I want to devise a building that is for them. Next. By a series of swathes, the, the, the project is still ongoing, so I haven't finished it. I'm, I'm still working it. The interchange between these orange things, which are sort of corpuscular feeders, uh, again, perhaps grandson or granddaughter of the the, the uh, cactus family, something allied to that, something allied to the the service ducting of preferred by the British high tech tradition. Something else again, it's it's more a kind of congealed effector of space, which I haven't quite got right yet. Next. Uh, overlaid with the necessary organization of the parts and the swathes running almost independently of that. Next. And the last slides uh, with our friend now beginning to be drawn, uh, beginning to affect actual space. And that was where I got um, two days before I took the plane. And uh, it's ongoing. And I'm willing to answer a couple of questions. Thank you. Michael. Yeah, I have to repeat the question, don't I? The, the basic question is uh, this issue of, of working without having to be commissioned to work and that it has been a theme of several speakers. I, I suspect a theme out of necessity. Um, two, two or three quick observations. One, that a whole series of people, um, some of them somewhat younger than me, but more or less a, a gang of people at, at the time based around the A, including Nigel Coates, Zaha Hadid, Will Alsop, Cook and Hawley, um, Ron Heron, um, Peter Wilson, it's just a name, uh, Peter Salter more recently. Everybody around town and in other places said, oh, these are arty characters, you know, they're drawers. Zaha is an artist, you know, Peter Wilson is a iron worker or, you know, Etc. Etc. They're all art people. They show in galleries, and they don't, they don't really want to build. You know. What is interesting is that all of us have now started building. Some more than others, but but you know, 
And I think if you take that list of people, there's some bloody good buildings that have come out of that. These same people who were written off. Uh, Bernard Chumi, again, was one, you know, before, before La Villette, was, oh, Bernard is a performance artist and stuff. All of these people, I think, if you put them together, can build a bloody site better than those po-faced people saying, oh, they're not. They're. It was a kind of conspiracy, uh, in a sense, to keep us off the game. Uh, by saying that uh, surely you get off on this, on, on you're so amused and satisfied, and and uh, by without having commissions that, that, that you know don't really want, you don't all the bother of getting your hands dirty. I think most of us, um, not that Chris and I have built much, but but you know, three or four bits now, um, we've actually found it much like. Dangerous things, but we've actually found it much easier than everybody was making out. You know, we don't seem to have had lots of complaints, and things don't seem to be leaking or collapsing, so touch on, on people's heads or anything. You know, we sort of come in on time and on budget, and and uh, you know, if you have a tricky problem with sort of gaskets or something, you you pull somebody in who knows about this. And and you know, we live in a sophisticated society. We have brilliant engineers that we work with, and and. You know, people who have done a few gaskets or whatever it might be, and it, it it really does strike you that it's a conspiracy. Now that's one issue. Um, the other question is at, at a creativity level whether one needs the detachment of not having a client, um, and it raises the sideways issue of what is the usefulness of doing a, a, a pre-written competition. I think that total constant self-indulgence would be dangerous. I'm not just being a British Puritan. I actually think that if you only did schemes that you had thought of yourself, you might work yourself into a sort of corner from which you couldn't get out. I rather like, in, in an ideal circumstance, I'd like to have it a sort of about a one in three. I'd like to be doing one thing that's building, one thing that was for a sort of tight assed brief that you try and work your way through, and one thing that was a total indulgence. Now, it doesn't sort of work out like that, but I think that... Uh, you do carry ideas. I've always thought, way back, I, can, I remember saying before we started building anything that one had projects that one did as sort of uh, able to be built, and other projects you did which were less able to be built. Now it's, it's slightly more particular that, that as one has started a bit of building, um, the, the non, the, the, the ideas that you think of for your own purposes probably are slightly wilder, as even as, as a priori notions, because the middle territory is being covered. That, I would say. The other thing is that some ideas are really carried in your, consciously or unconsciously, carried around with you for a length of time. The, the thing that I mentioned about the, the megastructure ones love hate for it, the thing about roes, the thing about mold, disintegration, deformation, exchange, movement. You know, I think the, the, the canteen in in Frankfurt would have been less important if it hadn't done something which one has been talking about for years, the thing of buildings being able to metamorphose. Okay, it's only the roof lifting up, but it does wall lift up and it looks pretty exciting when you're in there, you know. Wow. Oh. You know, not as if a little bit of it flaps, it all opens up. And it's 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 a piece of something that might have been a lot you know, we'd love to do something which that opened and then that moved and then that slid and then that did that. It tells you that it, it, it can be done in the same way as a veggie builder. I haven't yet done a veggie. The layered thing, um, the layered thing, Christine and I have talked about layers and meshes and so on. And okay, perhaps it's if you take the slide from the right point, but, but perhaps I slightly overlaid it, but that the Berlin housing does involve in, in, in a series of layerings. Um, and one can take lots and lots of slides to prove it. Okay, the shadow house would have been a marvelous thing to build, um, but you know you'd have to have a multi-millionaire to, to 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 do it. I think that lots of ideas exist also at different levels of 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 uh, doability, as it were. Like um, if it's a good idea, they're different. You know, somewhere the cactus that seems really daft. It seems really ridiculous. What the fuck do you do with a cactus? You know. And I think it was a cri de coeur. It was rather like that thing with the with the with the sleek, the tart, the corner. You know, being a cri de coeur, saying, "Look, you know, we always keep all our architectural 
icons and references within the known language of architecture. Rational languages, skin languages, vertebraic languages, languages of response, articulation, so on, so on. How's about the cactus? Because the cactus is pretty daft as an object. You look at a cactus and you say, come on, you know, you explain to a child how trees work. And, you know, but this thing is like, a, like, a, like as if it's been sort of botched together. You know, there's a bit of cactus leaf, and then it goes, and then a bit goes, and it really shouldn't, you know, it really shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be like that. But it is. You start off with an El Bocho, like the cactus, and you've only got to move somewhere and something comes out of it. Now, and you start drawing, you say, let's, <laughs> bloody cat. I mean, a bar of soap would be an equal, and a, you know, I must, soap city is just waiting to be developed, but, you know, bars of soap, used tires, lumps of coal. I did, you know, I haven't shown the scene way back, I used lumps and humps and all of that stuff. The cactus is a pretty nice one, because it's so stupid. And you think that if you can start wrapping that around, and getting something, one is also talking about kind of skin, flesh thing. I think what's going to happen is that the cactus and its progeny, meaning the, the bit in bright shite plants and now the orange things, will probably lead to some attitude towards sort of containerized cupboards or you know, something different that you do with floors or at all. I mean, at some point, I intend to build something that will derive from it, because it is more an attitude to uh, a certain party of architecture than it is saying it has to look green and yellowy green and have spikes on it. It's more that there is a, it's a sort of attitude towards substances. Um, am I answering your question? I'm not quite sure. Um, I think they're related, and I think that uh, it is not enough just to do... One of the things, yes, it is not enough just to do um, non-built projects, because one of the things I've noticed from the very few things I have built is actually the, the significance of certain objects that you see in space. For example, Christine and I on, on the housing in Berlin spent hours of sweat doing very sweet little curves and little sort of four-degree shifts and all this sort of stuff that's sort of in plan section. You go there, it looks like it looks, yeah, if you look at it, it shifts three, three and a half degrees, and yes, there is a little bit of a curve. But something hanging down really hits. You say, wow, that's really dark, that thing. Or that's really big, that thing. Or that's really deep, that hole. And I think you've got, you know, when the, when the roof of Frankfurt opens up, it really looks much larger than it does on, if you draw the, the section drawing, it only opens about that much. You, know, you think, yeah, well, it's right. You see it, and it looks as if the whole thing has exploded from within. Now, you cannot get to that unless you start building it. You know, however beautiful models you make, you know, stick your head in them and pinhole cameras and stuff, you never quite get it. And it's to do with the significance of objects seen in actual light. I find lighting the hardest thing of, of building. And, you know, in addition to what I showed, they have done a, a number of sort of exhibition structures and things. And, and always the lighting, whether it's natural lighting or artificial, very difficult. Now, I'm sounding like your real old, you know, roll-along designer, which is sort of what I am too. You know, no use doing a city with a whole attitude about directionality and layering and so on if you don't know what it's going to be like inside that layering. One built layer city, which is personal favorite of mine. You would need to, the, the bushes and the hedges and the things that melt and lay over, yes, and some of, sometimes you'd be underneath one of those things. And you'd have to draw it till you were nearly screwed dead to know or make models half full size to get it near. And, it, and that sort of information, actual information, so that you could do the next thing even better and more outrageous is I think the reason why you have to build if one says one is building as a laboratory experimenter or you know, not going to build very much, but is that, does that answer your question? Sort of. Yes, hi. Yeah? No. 
Uh, yeah, I, I know the. Con yes, go on with the question. Okay. Yes. Actually, that was a <coughs> that was a sort of trick juxtaposition of slides to get from the computer drawing, which was of the of the Hamburg land pier, to get on some similarity there was between that particular configuration and the the lifting roof. But they were actually two different scenes. But yes, answer quick answer. Um, I am pretty computer illiterate. I have a an Apple. Uh, on my desk, which I only <laughs> use as a word processor. Sometimes my students lead me by the hand and say, look, Peter, it's terribly easy to do thing, sort of. And, and, and the slightly stupider students are much better at this. I can sort of follow what they're on about. We, I, I'm, surrounded by, um, I'm surrounded by people uh, who are so computer literate that, that um, I'm almost put off. Um, I have no doubt that if I ever have a sort of, you know, spare three-week period, I will sort of sit down and at least wrap my head around being able to do. Um, probably, though, after the event. But, but I mean, there are people so. I mean, I have students who kind of, you know, doodle on the computer and do lovely things, and then actually do non-computer drawings when they want to get it, when they've got it sorted out, which I quite like. I quite like the idea of fake computer drawings. I, if I could just get a bit of, bit of literacy and then have a specially made straight edge that would have little nicks in it so that you could do the bits yourself to fake as if it's all been done. I, quite, I, 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 I want to patent this because I think it would be ideal for people like me. You know. um, I quite like... Uh, I think that when one's designing, I don't know. I mean, I'm also waiting for that thing where you can just sort of scribble away and there's some machine tracking you as you scribble and it's putting it into digitalized information and then you can sort of stop and say okay now I want it in 4D. I'm sure these things exist. I'm, I'm, I'm very lazy I suppose and um, also when I'm drawing I don't know what's going to come next I, uh, very often and that's even on fairly straight sort of sections. I'm drawing along and I think uh, like if I had to actually say yes it is going to do that and that tied up even 10 minutes of computer time, I get terribly irritated. Oh, fuck, I've got to stop thinking for the moment. Um, and it's interesting that Ron Heron, my, my good friend, who, who's, um, whose son is a sort of computer ace and whose office is sort of riddled with computers and does programs for Apple and stuff, um, he himself is hardly more computer literate than I am, or I'm probably giving away a trade secret. Because we're sort of doodlers, we're sort of scribblers. I'm, I'm, if, if somebody can convince me there's a cheap, immediately available computer that allows me to doodle without having to learn anything, I'll, I'll, I'll be there in a flash. You know, I mean. So intellectually, I'm a great believer. Practically, I'm, I'm still scribbling away in it with a, with a pen. Um, incidentally, um, I like scribbling with a pen rather than with a pencil. If I draw something in pencil, I don't take it seriously. I don't even sort of hardly register it. As soon as I have a pen in my hand, not only does it turn corners more easily, but I actually start focusing on it, by the way, in terms of media. But, um, oh, I think, they're I think they're lovely. I just wish I could be bothered, you know. <laughs> Okay, well thank you very much anyhow.